you for listening to the Full of Joy podcast today. So this is episode three in my social media series. So the layout that I wanted to have for this podcast was some series, some individual episodes. I just felt like series would be the best way to make sure that I talk about all the points I want to share for each subject. I really want to dive in to a lot of the topics on here. So I hope you are enjoying this first social media series so far. Before we get started today, I hope you will subscribe to this podcast and rate it anywhere you like to listen, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And while I record this, I'm actually also filming it so you can watch these podcasts on YouTube as well. I am staying on the topic of social media today and talking about social media as a business, how I reach out to brands, how I say yes and no to sponsorships, how I found my aesthetic and how I share that. I also want to talk about how I decide what to share and what to keep private. So let's jump in with talking about the business side because I always think that is so interesting, like how it all works behind the scenes. Also, this is how I I experience social media and having social media as part of my job. So these points and these experience can and probably do totally vary for others, other people that are influencers or use social media for marketing their business, other YouTubers. I've only ever experienced it for myself. So that is what I'm talking about today. So when I first started reaching out to brands that I liked, I would just scroll through my accounts that I followed on Instagram or I would go through my closet and look at all the stores I would primarily shop from. I would go through my makeup drawers and just get inspired by all of the brands, big or small, even if I would follow like little boutiques, like it didn't really matter like how big or small the brand or company was that I was reaching out to. And I would just message everyone I could think of. I would make a little template with some basic info about me and my social media platforms. And then I would add in some personal touches about how I connected with that brand and why it would be a good fit for me. And I would send out a bunch of emails or direct messages on Instagram. And I would spend like one full day every couple of weeks doing that and reaching out to all these different companies that I wanted to collab with or hope that they would sponsor me in some way. And so many of those emails and messages never got responses and occasionally one brand would respond and offer to send me like an outfit in exchange for a post on my social media. And I actually remember the first two brands that I ever collabed with and I was so excited. So I reached out to a store in the mall that I loved and they responded and said that I could pick out some things from their website in exchange for posts. And I just like couldn't believe that I was about to get free clothes (laughs) like the thought of them paying for me like for my time for my work my value that I was going to bring paying for my talent like getting compensated for it never even crossed my mind like it was my first collab ever I was just so excited and so after that first yes I was like oh my gosh I can't believe this worked so I kept doing that for like a year or so and as my audience grew and my engagement got stronger I was able to start taking spots sponsorships for these posts. So sponsorship means that based off of my statistics with engagement and followers, I could charge a fee for that post where before I was happy to just get cute clothes or whatever product I was talking about. But now I had more value in my posts and more people are actually listening and engaging and it will generate more buzz. So now I could charge a fee. So soon after this shift in my business, I was approached by some different agencies that help connect brands with creators. So since I was creating my social media content like around lifestyle and fashion and beauty and fitness these agencies helped connect me with brands with similar messages so currently I now have updated my little emails and my dms that I send out so now those messages include a media kit so a media kit has access to different social like all my different social channels and then those analytics Um, photos that represent my aesthetic and then I include a note on like the message that I want to share through my content so if I reach out to pitch myself to a brand that is what I will send them or if the agencies that I work with are connected to a brand they will pitch my brand for me and I only communicate with the agency 
So how I say yes and how I say no to sponsorships. So I actually say no to a lot more sponsorships than I say yes to. And, you know, I want to advertise brands that I actually use, actually wear or already have and love. Or if it is a new brand that I haven't tried before that, you know, that I'm open to trying, I will usually you know, just tell them that I'm new to this brand and I want to try it. And they'll usually send you products like weeks or months in advance to make sure it's a good fit. But if the brand doesn't offer that much turnaround time, just ask and see if they'll work with you on it. So the reasons I typically will say no to a sponsorship by a brand is the product is something that I wouldn't feel comfortable using, wearing, eating, or trying, much less promoting. Another reason that I'll usually pass on an offer is if the budget isn't you know big enough or does it feel right to me I know my worth and I know my value and I know the value that I bring to my posts and I know that I should be compensated fairly for that value I also know the time that it takes to finish the deal create the content edit the photos or the videos get feedback from the brand revise it all post it all post about the post it all just takes so much time and I don't have to do that for free or for a discounted price and I will find brands that would love to sponsor me at full price and brands are a great fit for my brand. So some of you that follow me, I feel like you feel really close to me and you feel like you can reach out to me and I love that and ask questions. And I know that some of you are also trying to grow your brand and, you know, start building your online business. And I think that's so cool that you can reach out to me for that. Um, but I get a lot of questions on like, how do I know where to set my prices at? And this actually has less to do with your follower count and more to do with reach and engagement that you receive. So you can have a small number of followers, but if those few followers are real and all want to support you, they will. They will always be engaging with your posts and excited to see what else you have to share. Even though my follower count isn't in the hundreds of thousands or millions, I'm still able to make a great income to contribute to my family. And this is my only job. And I love it because it gives me the flexibility to like, incorporate new businesses into my job, like this podcast, for example. And I have three other businesses that I'm starting behind the scenes right now. So if you're totally lost and don't know where to start your rates at, there's websites like Social Blue Book where you can sign in and link all your social channels like your YouTube channel, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, blog, Facebook, anything. And it will use all your analytics to help you determine what your rates should look like. And I always find this tool helpful and reassuring whenever I need to like stand my ground or even raise my rates. So I want to talk about income on social media platforms and the different ways that I earn an income with social media and how I want to change that. So currently I earn income from all of my social media platforms. So for example, on YouTube, you could do sponsorships. And recently, as an example, I've been working with a clothing store. So this store or an agency representing the store will reach out to me and say they're interested interested in sponsoring a video on my channel. So we will figure out what terms and rates work for both of us and we will decide on a budget for the video, what the video will be about. Sometimes the brand is involved with the title. There's contracts and creative briefs and mood boards to help inspire like the content creation. And then they'll send me the products and I will film the video, edit it, and send it back for review. And then once it's all approved, the video can go live on my channel for you guys to see it. And then once that's all said and done, I can send in an invoice or whatever they need um, for compensation. And then the deal is done. So on YouTube, there's sponsorships, there's commission codes, there's ad revenue, and some channels have access to even more ways to monetize their channel. So when you see ads pop up during a video, that channel could be earning revenue anytime someone clicks on that ad. So when there's links in the description box to a shirt that I was wearing, that's usually a link where I will earn commission from it if you use that link to place an order. Same idea for coupon codes. Like I, I talk about Miranda Fry jewelry a lot and I have a coupon code for that jewelry line because I love that jewelry so much and it's like 
all the pieces I usually wear. So I have a coupon code for that that I always share with you guys. So that kind of works almost like a commission link. So anytime that anyone places an order on Miranda Fry and uses my coupon code, I can earn a small commission off that order. And not all links and all codes are commissioned, but it is nice when they are because then I can keep track of how many sales are actually coming from me because I talked about it or because I wore a product or whatever. And it helps me to understand what kind of research I actually have with you guys. And then income on YouTube is similar to income on Instagram. So there's sponsored posts that can be like an IGTV, an in-feed post, Instagram stories. So what happens is a brand will come and say, we want to have a campaign on your Instagram feed this month. So for example, they could want like eight Instagram stories and three in-feed posts all across the month of May. So then they will send over like all the wording they want you to use, all the campaign hashtags hashtags you have to use in your captions, any inspiration. And then once everything is agreed upon and all those posts go up, I can send over an invoice to be compensated. So apart from sponsorships, you can also earn commission by using links to your outfits or lifestyle tools, hair tools, makeup products. So since I put myself in the lifestyle category, I can talk about kitchen tools or a new outfit and link those things. And sometimes I can earn commission if anyone buys something through those links. Other ways to earn income is by starting a business. So you can sell products like merch. You can work with suppliers to use your logo or phrases that you love and put them on clothing or phone cases, anything to promote your brand. And you can sell a product that isn't your brand, but it's something you love and something your followers would love. You can sell guides like fitness or nutrition guides. There are really just like endless opportunities to start businesses to sell to your followers. So then, like I said, I want my income streams to change eventually. I don't want to always be reliant on working with brands when I'm building my own brand. So this job is so great because it gives me the flexibility to incorporate new businesses into my job like this podcast. And like I mentioned, I'm building businesses on the side or kind of behind the scenes. And it's just so crazy that I can be working full time and love my job and keep adding to it to try even more things and find out what I really love. So I want to talk about aesthetic and I feel like having an aesthetic is so important when building a brand, but I also want to talk about not putting people in a box. So let's talk about my aesthetic to begin with. I want to talk about how I define it, why it works and why people like it. So this is how I define my aesthetic, simple, neutral, attainable, hopeful, joyful, classic, and clean. (laughs) So there's probably more words I could use to describe it, but those are like the top first ones that I thought of. And those are all things that I want to encourage. So I wear outfits that are clean and neutral colors. I love just like a classic form fitting outfit. I decorate my house with classic neutral clean decor because that will be in the background of my videos. I will smile in my photos and like laugh with my photographer to show joy. I'll talk about my season of healing and encourage hope that seasons change and good things come. I'll talk about that in my videos, but also in my Instagram captions. I talk about my story and my journey, my journey to health, my journey to marriage. I think that that's why people have liked my social channels and I was able to grow this following is because I have a lot of my story online. So here's how that story started. So early on when I was starting my channel and posting to Instagram with the intention of making this a business, I went through a breakup. And I decided to make a video about the breakup and how I was hopeful for the future, how I was able to move on happily, how I was able to heal from it. And I had never shared anything that felt so vulnerable online before. I never really watched videos like that. I hadn't really seen it done, but I felt like I should share how good can come from this heartbreaking thing. And that that went over good. So, so many girls related to it. And even today, my friends will message me and be like, oh my God. I just, you know, watched your breakup video. Thanks so much. Then after that breakup video, I decided to document a confusing time in my life when I was struggling to figure out how to heal my body and stop feeling sick. And I talked a lot about that in my first episode of this podcast. And I opened up about how scared I was, how I was searching for answers and eventually how I healed. Then I started dating Brett. 
And I thought it was a good time for me to be brave and move out. And I never thought I would move out of my parents' house until I was married, but I changed my mind and, you know, decided I was going to move out and I did it and I documented that whole process. And then we got a dog and then we got engaged and then we got married and then we went on a honeymoon and then we moved into our house together. So many big life events happened when I started my channel. So there's a lot of stories on my channel and I think people love to see those journeys and they love to follow along with this story. I also wanted to mention too that having an aesthetic does not mean you have to put yourself in a box or that you can put someone else in a box. The category I typically use to describe my content is lifestyle and that can mean a lot of things and really anything I take an interest in can kind of be put under that umbrella. But sometimes I see fitness bloggers put in a fitness box and fashion bloggers put in a fashion box and there's pros and cons to that and you know you can become really well known in that category and people People think fitness, they think of you. People think fashion, they think of you, which can be great. But, you know, that's awesome to be so successful in your field. But the cool thing about social media is that you can share how complex you are. And fitness bloggers usually look amazing in their outfits. So I love to see their fashion. And fashion bloggers always know like the cute places to take pictures. They always know where to get like the best food. That's like Instagrammable food. So I love to follow them for travel inspo. And people are just so complex. Complex. Like you are just so complex. So sink into that. You don't have to decide one path and call that your aesthetic. Make your interests fit into your life and that will fit into your aesthetic. So with this storytelling and with all this sharing I love to do for my job, I also love to have a quiet private life that no one knows about. So a life that I share only with my husband and family and friends, a life that I don't show to the world that follows me. So I want to talk about how I have boundaries with social media and real life. So I was never the girl to post every detail. I want to give you guys context on why I post the things I post by sharing some details, but not every part of every day and every thought that I think. And sometimes in my vlogs, I'll take the camera with me for a day while we're traveling or shopping or if I'm working. And even when I vlog, I can talk to the camera all day. But the thing is, like, I know the camera is on. I turn the camera on. I know what I'm going to share with my followers. I know that these words are going to be heard on my channel. And not to say that I won't offend someone because I know what's happening or not to say that I won't say something really stupid because that's happened. But I know I'm not going to overshare. I don't ever want to overshare share about the actual details of my life in my days. I think my videos where I'm vulnerable about stories in my life are very different than sacrificing my private life for the sake of content. So I'm always finding the balance or more I'm finding the boundary between what is vulnerable and what is private. So how do I decide what things are private? I think that is something you just feel and that will change from person to person, heart to heart. Everyone is different. To me, I feel like the things that are sacred to me, I like to keep private. So here's a good example. When we got engaged and we were planning our wedding, I wanted to film a series of videos for my YouTube channel on wedding planning. Obviously, getting married to Brett is such a sacred thing to me, but I knew that I was in control of what I was going to share in this series. I was so excited because I loved wedding planning with Brett. It was just the most fun time ever. We just had a blast. So I knew that my joyful perspective on something like wedding planning could be nice to see, especially a topic like planning a big event because that can definitely cause stress or anxiety for some couples. So I planned a bunch of videos. There's actually 38 videos in my wedding planning playlist on YouTube. So I filmed the processes as we were going through them. I talked about things like venues, guest list, dresses, but I also wanted to share more vulnerable topics like the five things I didn't expect about getting engaged and a video to my future husband. And I was able to make joyful content about my experience of wedding planning and marriage planning and ultimately our wedding day while still experiencing the sacred, life-changing transformation of it all privately with Brett. All right, so let's talk about how I have boundaries with social media and real life. I talked about this a lot in episode number two, where I shared how I've been practicing intentional posting and intentional scrolling. In addition to that, I've 
also been following a weekly schedule. So I know what days I film, what days I work on this podcast, what days I need to take pictures, what days are spent on a laptop getting computer work done. I love having the schedule so I can be more organized and feel good about the content I'm putting out. This schedule also allows me to be fully in work mode and then fully be in home wife dog mom mode whenever work is over. I just hate to be distracted when I'm doing either. I want to be fully there for my work and then fully there for my family and following a schedule especially a posting schedule has helped you know give me that so I want to talk about how I decide like when to film and when not to and I was talking to Brett about this question and he said that he thought I was really good at not making other people feel uncomfortable and I took that as a really good compliment and I think I am like an empathetic person I always envision myself in other people's shoes even like when I watch movies sometimes I get like anxiety because I imagine myself like in this movie and dealing with this crazy storyline of the character in the movie but my point is that I try to think of the people around me especially when I'm filming in public when I'm filming I'm working I'm on I am ready I know what I'm saying to the camera people around me are not working they're just shopping at Target or wherever I am they don't want to be bothered I want them to respect that I'm filming and not like try to photobomb whatever I'm doing so I have to respect their space too. And same thing goes for taking photos at like a coffee shop or wherever I am. But like as an example, a coffee shop, a coffee shop is not my studio to have free reign over if I'm taking photos in there. I will look for a little table, preferably in a corner or by a window for the lighting and do my thing. It's like me and my photographer, we're not going to bother anyone. We're not going to get in anyone else's way. We don't want anyone else in the photo. I'm there for me in my pictures, you know, and they're at this coffee shop just as much as I am there. And we both have to respect each other's space. I also feel like this when I'm vlogging with my friends or family. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable or nervous. So like being on camera is my job, not theirs. And they don't expect me to sit down and work with them if I see them at work. So I don't expect them, you know, to start filming with me either. So if you follow me closely though, you would know that my sister and my mom also use social media a lot for their jobs. So when I am with them, it's a little bit more laid back. But even then, when we're together, we're not usually working. We're spending time together. So let's talk about comments. There's comments, rates, reviews, thumbs up, thumbs down, subscribe, follow, unfollow, like. There's all these weird things that are a part of my job. And I was talking to one of my friends the other day and we were talking how, you know, like I could film a video on Tuesday, put it up on Wednesday, and right when I put it up, I'll get instant feedback an instant rating, an instant review from my followers, which I love. I'm so thankful for the followers that choose to support me and encourage me to build my platform. But it is so weird to be like instantly gratified or instantly shamed for your work. There's, I feel like there's not many jobs like that where someone, anyone can just look at your work that you've worked so hard on and say, nope. <laughs> like literally you could just say, mm, no. Obviously, that's part of life and rejection and acceptance is everywhere, but it is interesting and sometimes confusing for me as I navigate through it and decide where I want this job to take me. So going along with that, I want to talk about the ways that I handle positive and negative comments. I really wanted to talk about this subject and I'm glad I waited till the final episode. So depending on your platforms and your audience, your aesthetic and your message, comments and how you handle them can be totally different. But what I experience in my comment section is a higher level of support than hate. There's definitely both, but most of my followers or people who view my accounts are people who are choosing to support me in some way. And I've said it in this podcast so many times, but I hope that I encourage joy and positivity through my content. And because I bring this hopeful message and positive energy to my pages, I'm hoping it will attract more joy and bigger joys and shared joy joy. So since I receive both positive and negative feedback on my platforms, I had to learn how I was going to handle them.
them in a healthy way for me. So anytime I struggle with something, I'm so thankful I get to talk to my husband about it. I love talking to him because he has this amazing ability to be really understanding and he can think so clearly through things and sees all sides and he's just the best person to have around for someone like me. So dealing with negative comments or hate was something I was not good at. I didn't know how a person could handle this. I'm a sensitive person, so I thought maybe this job just isn't for me. Maybe I'm too sensitive to handle this. And then I would see positive comments and think, you know, thanks for your support, but I'm not that good person that you think I am. I am full of flaws. I am full of mistakes. I'm full of accidents. And you know, I'm actually not smart enough to never offend anyone. It's happened. I've offended multiple people multiple times on my social media platforms. So I've seen people comment things like this. You are just so sweet and kind. You are such a good wife. You're the nicest friend. Anything like that. And I'm sorry, but that's just not true. I enjoy spreading a positive message about joy, but I'm not always joyful. I enjoy being a good wife and giving our marriage what I think a good wife is, but some days I'm not that good wife. And I enjoy seeing my friends and encouraging healthy relationships, but I'm not always seeking out my friends and making them feel loved. So I am not always worthy of this praise, just like I'm not always worthy of the hate. And the praise made me feel pressured to always present myself in this good way. And the hate made me feel like I'm not strong enough to handle this job. So I had to learn that my value does not lie in the comments, reviews, or ratings of my platforms. My worth really doesn't have anything to do with what someone else says about it. The positive and the negative feedback keeps me balanced. It helps me be accepting of and excited for change. It helps me evolve, grow, and learn. I rarely read the comment section because I know my worth and my value live so far outside of those words. Okay, so I feel like I shared so much about behind the scenes of social media, and I hope this series is bringing some insights into how I'm building my dream career on social media and some of the benefits I receive from being on social media. So I hope that through listening to this third episode and the episodes to come on this podcast that you feel encouraged to create a place for joy in your life. I hope that you will welcome joy, invite joy, and seek days that are full of joy. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. I want to invite you guys to subscribe or follow this podcast anywhere you like to listen, Spotify, iTunes, and Google Play, and follow us on Instagram at Full of Joy Podcast. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.